Hi, everyone, and welcome to AGL Live. I'm Elizabeth Raley, and I'm on the working group at AGL and a director at Civic Actions. I'm going to kick us off today by telling you a little more about our organization. AgileGov Leaders is a nonprofit org that aims to transform the culture of government by bringing agile and innovative practices to public service delivery through shared knowledge and community. We host things like this event today, and we have resources on our website. Um, you can find out more about us. You can contact us or sign up for our newsletter on our website, which is agilegovleaders.org. And I'll also put that in the chat. Um, we are really excited to have this panel discussion today. And we're talking about UX and modern development. Um, we would love audience participation and welcome you to post questions in the chat so um, our panelists can see them. And we're going to be moderated today by Alexa Choi. She is going to introduce herself and then um, ask the panel to do introductions and then launch into the first question for the panelists. So Alexa, over to you. Alexa, I need to unmute you, sorry. Actually, un try to unmute yourself. I'm sorry, I wasn't able to do it. No, no worries. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I appreciate that. Um, welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. I really appreciate everybody coming today. This is a super exciting topic, very hot in the market right now, and we have a dynamite panel for you today. My name is Alexa Choi. I will be your moderator, and I'm going to pass it over to the panel to introduce themselves. So we will go ahead and start with Rachel and um, move on from there. So. Hi, I'm Rachel Croft and I'm a senior UX and uh, designer and researcher at Civic Actions. Uh, Civic Actions is a consultancy and we work with all levels of government. So it's like local, state and federal. And we do multiple kinds of projects from triple development to um, focusing on user research and redeveloping great services and business processes. Perfect, thank you. And Mike Palmer, usual suspect, I might add. Hey, I'm Mike Palmer. I work for the US Digital Service um, here at the Department of Homeland Security. I am an acquisition strategist. So I work with uh, components throughout uh, the Department of Homeland Security. Um, I advise them on procurement related aspects. My mission is to get them uh, better outcomes on their procurements, get amazing companies in. And uh, we've been using design as a discriminator uh, amongst those companies to get some amazing uh, vendors in that actually understand how to create products um, with great user experiences. Happy to be here. Perfect. Thank you so much. And Dana? Hi, I'm Dana Chisnell, and I'm co-executive director at the Center for Civic Design, where we work on making every interaction that the public has with government uh, efficient, effective, and pleasant. I am also an adjunct lecturer at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, where I teach a course on design in government. Uh, I got invited to do that because of my experiences working for the U.S. Digital Service in the Obama White House in the first cohort. Uh, while I do all government now, I worked in the private sector for decades before moving to government, so I'll bring that too. Perfect. Thank you so much, Michael Akendo. All right. Thanks, Alexa. My name is Michael. Uh, I've been a UX specialist and product technology innovation um, specialist over the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, started my career with Accenture, uh, worked in both government projects as well as private projects uh, with companies like Bloomberg, Fannie Mae, and Technique. Uh, so really excited to share some of my experiences from a UX perspective and looking forward to questions from the audience. Perfect, thank you so much. We'll come over to Christy. Good afternoon. I am Christy Hermanson and I lead design and user experience at GSA for the integrated award environment. We are responsible for websites, I don't know if you know them, um, fbo.gov, fpds.gov, sam.gov, uh, cpars.gov, uh, a large number of contracting and grants award systems. We are bringing all of them together into a single website. It's a huge project. Uh, we have more than 3 million users across all of our websites, so I'm very much um, interested in enterprise UX, 
and doing agile at scale and how those two things work together. So thank you for inviting me here today. Perfect. Thank you. I believe every single one of those websites is near and dear to every person on the call. So thank you. Thank you for that effort. Also, I um, wanted to wrap up the panel introductions with JC. Thanks, Alexa. Um, hi, everyone. My name is JC Chakravarti. Um, I'm a senior UX ME at Appian Corporation. Um, Appian is a low code platform that enables organizations to quickly be able to build business applications. Um, before Appian, I used to work uh, for a federal government contractor, and I've um, worked closely with the government for over 10 years. Glad to be here. Perfect. Thank you so much. Excellent. All right, we're going to go ahead and kick off the entire discussion with the first question, which is, help us get more familiar with UX and where it fits into the modern agile dev team structure. So I'm going to hand this over to our super duper competent and awesome panel. And I guess we can start, I'm going to start with Dana and work our way up the list. So Dana, why don't you start first? And then Hi. So user experience design is the practice of understanding the needs of humans and the problems that they're trying to solve. Um, it involves a number of methods or techniques and practices, some of which have been formalized, like usability testing. Uh, originally, UX design looked across the entire experience uh, a user might have with a service or a product, um, across all of the channels. But over the years, for some bizarre reason, uh, UX has become something that is much more focused on digital, specifically websites and apps. Um, I am sad to see this, but whatever. Um, uh, where this fits into Agile is that everyone should be paying attention to the user experience and constantly asking, what is the experience we want our users to have? But my experience has been that more often, the reality is that everyone's focused on development, on velocity, on completing so-called user stories, um, rather than building a system that actually meets the needs of the users, we get focused on the needs of the business. Um, independent of having any sort of conscious, intentional UX practice, the truth is that Agile in government is a lot of um, everybody doing what they think it is all the time um, without uh, a lot of discipline or uh, without much in the way of vision. A lot of documentation. <laughs> Yeah. Contrary to Agile, yes. <laughs> right? I, I, yeah. Um, okay, perfect. Thank you so much for that. We'll, we'll come over to JC. JC, what are your thoughts when it comes to um, UX and the way that it fits into the more modern Agile dev teams? I know you had mentioned SAFE during your introduction. And so, um, you know, SAFE is a scalable Agile. How, does, how do you get the UX in cadence with the rest of the team? Sure. Uh, that's a great question. So, um, I think of... Agile and UX, like it has a very good synergy. And what I mean by that is like essentially three things that, you know, if the audience wants to take away, um, I would say these three things. One thing is number one would be impact, right? Like if you look at the basic building block um, of, of an Agile uh, implementation is that of a user story, right? A user story is something that is basically business driven as opposed to back in the day when we had waterfall where it was more focused on technical detail. Um, and we want to make sure that uh, from a UX perspective, like how do we make sure that the UX uh, base, especially on based on user research adequately informs a user story, right? And I think that's one thing, being able to empathize with our users and translating that into specific user stories that can be built upon, right? Um, the second factor would be that of efficiency. Like if we're able to have a design to developer conversation um, using design mockups, being able to spike using design mockups, um, a, lot, a lot of that can really fit into the current agile construct. Um, and also finally it goes into culture where like, if you think about an agile team, you have a scrum master, you have a product owner, and then you have a scrum team. There's no role definition in a scrum team. There's no developers or testers, right? So technically anyone can be, anyone who's representing your users can actually be a designer, right? So being able to play that up and make sure everyone can represent the user, I think that's one way to make sure agile teams can implement UX. Thank you, JC, sure. super helpful. Um, Christy, what are your thoughts on this one? You have an hour? <laughs> I, have, I have a lot of thoughts on this one. Um, so 
so first of all, um, I have a software development background, and I've been doing Agile since about 2005, 2006 for a really long time. Um, there's, and there's, there's actually, a, I'm going to paste a link into the chat here on an article that's maybe about six months old that I really like. So this article kind of traces the history of Agile and user experience and talks about how user experience is essentially a waterfall process that doesn't necessarily fit neatly into Agile. There are certain things like usability testing where you're testing, you know, small user interface controls, you know, very um, fine-tuning fine kinds of activities that fit nicely into an Agile cadence. But some of the bigger activities, like really going in and assessing what your user goals and needs are, and some of those things really work better as an upfront activity, which is not Agile. Um, as a user experience person, um, even though I love Agile, I, I kind of flip the question around and say, well, how can Agile serve user experience, as opposed to how do we fit user experience into Agile, which sometimes is a, you know, a square peg in a round hole. So. Um, this particular article recommends a dual track strategy where you've got your regular agile cadence for things that are fairly well defined and you're doing some of that fine tuning. But for some of those bigger upfront activities of going in and really assessing and making sure that you're solving the right problems for your user, that take more time taking that off, putting it on its own cadence, letting that you know, organically get to the point where it needs to be defining those tasks, and then integrating those with your backlog um, of, of activities on the other track. And that, we have a very large program, a lot of different teams were coordinating across nine different development teams alone, plus data security, all of that. So there is some runway that we have to build up um, to keep those things aligned. And we're very much implementing that type of dual track strategy where um, there's some, some activity that's part of that normal cadence, but some of it we've pulled off and have done in more of a traditional waterfall, waterfall method. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. That's um, how can Agile serve UX? That's a fun question. I like it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Okay, coming over to Michael Akindel, and then we're coming to Mike Palmer right after that. Okay, I'll try to keep this simple. Uh, from my experience, I found that uh, Agile, by definition, is, is very flexible and it requires a lot of communication um, within team members. And being someone who's practiced UX over the last few years, um, it's important for one to always think about how UX plays a role of being a resource to the Agile team. So for those, for the people in, in projects that I've seen where UX can become very successful, is when UX takes more of a people, sort of more of a leadership role, not necessarily bossing people around, but taking it from the perspective of being more fact-based because the core of UX is really demonstrating how we're building products for users and what problems it solves for them. So prioritizing things like function, using data to make decisions, and being able to be a voice for the customer really helps to, um, uh, as a resource for the Agile team. Perfect. Thank you so much, Michael. I appreciate that. Okay, coming over to Mike Palmer. Hey, just to build off of what Michael just said really quick, uh, we ask companies who they have in their leadership team that uh, would represent uh, design at a higher level. And that really is a barometer of how much a company actually cares about the impact of uh, a user-centered approach in their operations. And we use that as to, to, to indicate how truly dedicated in terms of corporate culture, hiring practices, that it's, it's just a quick way to, to differentiate from one company to another. So that's something I, I hope, I think companies are starting to get that message that even at the leadership level, that there needs to be representation of, of uh, US, UX as a, as a practice, practice. And so I guess that's what I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. That's really interesting. So would it be like a CUXO, <laughs> Chief UX Officer? <laughs> well, I mean, usually it comes in the form of a VP or uh, some kind of director that sits right. in the leadership meetings, plays a part in strategic corporate decision making. I mean, mm -hmm. how many traditional companies in the government space do you actually see that? Um, uh, and, none that I know of. 
<laughs> right. So I, I think, but I, there are, they are out there. And I think uh, when we ask those questions, I think uh, those companies really stand out and they show their, their, uh, their dedication to that practice, I think. Got it. That's super helpful. The VA did have a chief design officer for a while, so. Chief design awesome. officer, CDO, got it. That's what it is, chief design officer. I like it, perfect. Excellent, thank you so much, Dana, I appreciate it. Um, coming over to Rachel. Rachel, what are your thoughts on the first question? Yeah, I'm also like Christy, I also have a lot of thoughts on this. <laughs> so I think it comes down, so there's a, I agree with a lot of things that have been said here around like empathizing with the end customer, and like really being that kind of advocate but i think it's also being an advocate for our clients and having empathy for people who are working for internally in terms of stakeholders who are really wanting to see a project get done um create a good service for the public and working with those people too to understand like what their needs are within the organization and um figuring out how to like make good things with them right and so i think being that collaboration glue also with kind of the organization is, is huge um, to bring into kind of government, um, especially I'm speaking also from a consultant's perspective, right? Um, not necessarily working um, kind of like internally within an agency. But within that, one of the things that I, I think a UX designer can do is still trying to like bridge gaps between agencies and go and talk to tons of people and apply those kind of user research skills um, internally. Um, to kind of help departments talk to each other about what services can be delivered that can be the most effective solution for end users. Um, Absolutely, so, I think that's one of the most exciting things about digital services, US digital yeah. services, is they talk to lots of different agencies and that, I think that's so awesome. Exactly, and I think going back to Dana's point of like not seeing also UX is like only about creating a digital service, but it's just creating a service, period, right? And this is where like service design comes into play and um, how that can work with agile, I think is totally workable and doable because um, you can have iterative services that you just like kind of keep prototyping and keep seeing how that works. Um, and agile, I think like some other folks said too of um, having that serve design because it's just a project management framework, so much of it, even though I know it has so much philosophy and great communication principles. Um, it very much um, needs to serve kind of like um, kind of like the greater goal um, and be questioned if like that's the right framework um, to be used, right? How can Agile serve UX? <laughs> it's not, Absolutely. I think like, I would say it's, it's serving like the best possible service that you could yeah. make for the public, right? It's not even like UX, I don't want to like make a turf war between disciplines or or like skill sets that doesn't make any sense. I think it's more about like, how can we have all these amazing tools as humans? Like, how can we create the best possible thing for each other? And right. um, that's why all these tools exist, right? Um, right. Is, is for that. I love it. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Cool, all right. Um, I don't see any audience questions over here. It says UX design is the collaboration glue. Yes, Beth, whoever just said that in the audience. Definitely agree, and it came from Rachel's comments, so really appreciate it. If anybody in the audience wanted to actually post more questions in the Zoom group chat, um, we could also be embedding those answers within the questions that we're asking and the answers that we're answering, so please feel free to do that. Uh, well, moving right along, we're going to go to our second question, which I think is near and dear to our hearts as the audience. <clears throat> and that question is, give us a little bit of guidance on providing really good talent to the government who want to hire UX and don't know how. So I think at the, the basis of this question is, how do we recognize good UX talent? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Um, and how do you know when you, when you see it, right? So that's kind of the question. And we're going to start with Christy, um, since she's got a massive implementation she's working on there. <laughs> uh, thank you. So, so what has worked best on our team, um, really, it's a mindset, and we talked about this a little bit in preparing for today, and, and it's a mindset that I'm looking for. And what really works best for us is people who can make connections between what they do and what other people on the team are doing. So you might have a title of user analyst, or you might have a title of designer, or um, you might be a business analyst, or, but regardless of what your title is or what you're doing, um, really look for people um, who can who 
So I've had people who come in as graphic designers who do beautiful work. And I use very little of it because they have a hard time getting their mind around the business problem that we're trying to solve. Um, I have a guy now who's a user analyst for me um, who's doing a great job. And his, I think his degree is, um, is in economics, um, <laughs> of all things. But he's doing his user analysis, but he's looking over the shoulder of the designers and is really curious about what they're doing and how they're applying his work. And he's going off in his own time and he's actually teaching himself to program in Ruby just because he's curious about how this stuff works under the hood. So I look for people with a wide range of skill sets. And I'm going to post another um, link into the chat. Um, it's an article, What Makes a Good U UI, UX, or Great. And they use a term called product generalist. And a product generalist they describe as somebody who can really make those connections between all the different disciplines that go into making a great user experience. And that's, that's really what sets somebody apart for me is um, not somebody who's a specialist in one area, but somebody who knows, um, who, who has diverse skills and knows how what they do fits in with everybody else. Hmm. I'm sure those people are easy to find. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised, you know, that they, it, it, it's not always a particular um, background. Um, those people you find them with really wide range of backgrounds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Awesome. So we have a question from the audience. How can we square the iterative nature of both UX and the agile process with the an annual capital cycle? How can you make a budget ask? How can you make a budget ask replicant request between the if you have it? Okay. I think what somebody's asking about on um, the, the question here, and maybe we can embed that question within some of the answers here is really a sprint zero. Um, that's a sprint zero situation, I think. So if you guys wanted to answer that. I don't think we're going to answer it kind of like right now, but let's kind of keep going with this question that we're asking right now, how to find good UX talent. We're going to go to um, JC next, and then we'll go to Dana right after. So we'll continue there and we'll get to these questions, I promise. <laughs> um, I, think, I think Christy captured it pretty well, but uh, a few things I would add to that is one thing is um, when you're looking uh, for UX talent, first look inside your organization right? Um, look for, uh, for a customer facing or user facing roles where you've seen examples of um, where some of the, the folks you have on the team have worked closely with a user or have empathy for a user, have driven that into um, how that's gotten into your backlog, right? Um, I think another maybe uh, idea to look at is the beauty of UX is not just looking at what the user wants, but also keeping in mind like some of the technical constraints that go along with an implementation, looking at how that also impacts the business, right? Um, so I think someone who is overarching, like an architect who's looking not just as what, what the user wants, but also looking at business and technical constraints and combine that with good amount of like sense of user empathy. Um, I think, I think that's, that would be a good solution to look for. Perfect. Thank you. I think your answer was a little bit like Christy. It's somebody that has a mixed background, maybe. Perfect. Thank you, Dana. Coming over to you. And then Michael Akendo will be next. So we'll go Mike Palmer and then we'll go Rachel. Yeah, when I worked uh, for the U.S. Digital Service, uh, my, my title was generalist problem solver. And I came in as a researcher, but I, I did everything that needed to be done. And it turns out that this is a really good way to work in UX and in agile teams generally uh in uh in government and i think that's probably true in any large organization that's trying to do this sort of work um uh the key uh there and within the team that i work on now really is uh as as christy mentioned uh multiple skills you might be super strong in one but have enough in the other ones that you can pull off some good uh deliverables or good research or whatever um, and if you're in a, in a good cross-functional team, um, that makes all the difference of having multiple, multiple skills. I think the difficult thing in government is that there is this, um, uh, this thinking around what the job description is, and this is true in big companies too, where you have a visual designer, you have, uh, an interaction designer, you have a researcher, um, and you might have variations on those uh, roles, but what do you do with your information architect when there's no information architecture to do? Like, 
can they do research? That's really what you want is to have a strong bench where everybody can um, play at all the time. Right, right. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. Um, so we're going to do something kind of cool with the next question, but we're going to keep going with this particular question for now. So Michael Lakindo, what do you think about finding good UX talent? Okay, I'm going to keep this a little bit more simple and focus on more of uh, personality. I think it's important to, 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 to look for people who can work well with others. Because um, a lot of times as UX designers, um, people generally think they, they expect that you should just produce a design. Uh, and from my experience, uh, you know, a lot of the roles I've had recently, uh, it, it, a lot of times it comes down to maybe only designing maybe 20% or even 30% of the entire sort of workload. And the other 70% is spent in front of people trying to, to, to learn from them, to, to, to persuade them, to be able to demonstrate um, research data, to be able to present user research data and be able to ask questions. And really um, it, having, looking for people that are on the team that can get along with other members of a team can make or break a project. Because um, I've had experiences where collaborating with people on the team can be a challenge. And then in other instances, you're working with people who understand that, hey, to get this done, we all have to collaborate. Um, so it's very important to, to think about what sort of culture you want to build and the sort of environment and the types of people you want to bring in and make sure that they can all get along. I love it. That's play nice in the sandbox, Michael. I like that. Perfect. Okay, Mike Palmer, coming over to you with this question. I'm sure you have some thoughts about it. I'd love to hear them. Well, yeah, I mean, I think of it in terms of uh, bringing vendors in to help feds mm -hmm. uh, and finding awesome partners uh, to bring in. Um, less of from the hiring standpoint how vendors would actually hire their own people and the way to do that the way to get awesome vendors in is to include design actually in your requirements and in your eval criteria um, and your evaluations and weaving it in to actually be important otherwise you're not going to get awesome vendors um, so that is what we're doing let me ask you a question about that one when you actually require UX in your RFIs or RFPs, how do you evaluate that? Or, you know, it's, it's kind of rather than quantitative, it's, it's harder to say like, this is right, this is wrong. This is better, this is worse. So how do you, sit, how do you pick a, a person to be more successful than somebody else? Yeah, I'll tell you after, I'll, I'll tell you the story of what we recently did, but I can see Dana chomping at the bit and I'm excited to hear what she has to say about this because I know she's gone through an evaluation with us before. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Mike and I worked together as a digital service on a big procurement where we used design as, uh, as a criterion for selection uh, with Agile and engineering. And um, part of what you're looking for in that situation is uh, process. Like, do they actually ask questions about who the users are and what, they're, what the jobs of the users uh, are like? Um, do they actually ask questions about what the environment is like that the users are working in? So we were procuring a system for, um, uh, we were procuring uh, for all of DHS, but I was paying attention to immigration, for example. Um, so did any of the teams ask questions about what it was like to be an immigration officer? Um, so uh, a lot of the evaluation criteria are around, um, is there anybody on the team who represents design or UX? Um, are they allowed to do the work? Um, and what's the relationship like uh, with the rest of the Agile team? And what kinds of processes and practices do they use in getting to solutions to uh, design and development problems? Yeah, so just a quick story. We did a, so one of the lessons learned from Flash is that design really is a discriminator amongst companies and uh, to create products um, and services for uh, the public that are amazing. Um, and so we had uh, a two-stage competition recently that had design as a downslide. We had the, the vendors submit two work examples in the forms of uh, a web, two websites. So, and then we had them speak to, in a video, 
each of those work examples. Um, and they were allowed to pick six um, different competencies within design, whether it be content strategy, user research, um, uh, data architecture, um, there were six. Uh, I'm sure the whole panel could rattle off the other six. Anyway, so, um, and in the end, uh, we cared less about the actual experience and how, and cared more, and the criteria was written up in terms of, we cared about how they talked about design and how they talked about users. And if they lumped groups of, of users in with each other when they were doing user research or if they looked at individual personas. Um, and uh, there are different things that different, basically those who talked about users uh, in what my design experts told me was the right way. And there isn't one right way, but uh, it was like night and day. You had those who understood who were up here and then there really wasn't really a middle layer. And then there was those who didn't. And then there was those who just bombed. But I mean, it was pretty clear, distinctly clear. Um, and then we had a coding challenge after that. And that's where they got a chance to show their tech chops. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's how we're using design as a discriminator. That would I appreciate oh, that. Mike, you learned so much. Sure. I know. Thank you so much, Mike, and thank you, Dana, for that. I really appreciate it. We're gonna come up to Rachel on that question about finding good UX talent. Um, Rachel? Yeah, so I'm gonna, I think, take the question in a slightly different direction, if that's okay. Um, and more just talk about capacity building in general within government and how there are multiple ways to do that, right? So you don't necessarily have to look for um, an outside agency or you don't also have to hire directly like UX designers, right? I think there's a lot of ways of like running workshops and like training people internally in Gov and a ton of different kinds of skills to try and get them to embed that within their own work and processes. Um, and obviously like having engagements and having um, like having and uh, hiring full-time UX people is like, I think kind of the next phase. But when I think about kind of an iterative approach, if you're not like at all have any kind of UX that exists today, um, how can you just at least like learn a little bit about it? So then you can start to understand, oh, like what I might even look for if we even, do we even need a full-time person to do this? Probably, but kind of like slowly build up your knowledge around it. And I think um, getting kind of education and having that, I know Civic Actions is like very passionate about um, also wanting to do that and um, like train procurement officers and like what they should be um, like looking for in those contracts, but as well working with like specific leaders within government agencies to come together and understanding like how could they best work together? How could they bring in UX talent? How could they bring in good development talent? And even just like start from even like, like even further back in the process kind of in what that whole thing could even look like. Um, Cause I think, uh, you know, enablement is so important in like teaching someone how to fish versus doing it for them is, is huge. Um, and I, I personally like love educating like non UX people, like UX things and bringing them along on interviews and like really making them a part of that process. So then they like viscerally know and understand like what the value is. And so then when they look for someone to do that full time, like they really understand the value. Um, mm -hmm. And like, it's just kind of like embedded within now, like what they, what they need. Absolutely. And I also feel like there's a little bit of cross training in there that I really like in your answer that I feel is really valuable. Um, if when you're doing user interviews and people kind of attend those that don't necessarily do UX or it's probably very enlightening for people um, to understand what it, what it looks and feels like for sure. Totally. Because I think like one of the biggest things you can facilitate as a UX person is like really trying to having empathy for your end users as well as kind of general constituents. And you can't be the only one to like bear that torch, right? Like you have right. to facilitate that process for other people. Um, and um, it's, it's huge. And people actually don't realize how much like they enjoy it. Like when they kind of get out there and then start listening and talking to people. Um, yeah. I like that. That's a great idea. Can I, can I add to that? Yeah. Sure. I, I, I think that was a really, really great point. Um, I was part of an organization that essentially 
held design thinking workshops. And essentially what they did is they wanted to sort of um, teach concepts of design thinking. And they did this, they must have done like anywhere from 15 to 20 sessions with different groups and different levels of management. And what came out of it was a lot of these groups were, were leaders of, of technology products. And as you can imagine, they had hundreds and hundreds of products and they weren't quite sure how to go about solving some of those problems. But going through these design thinking workshops, it sort of gave, uh, it gave them an opportunity to see how design thinking could be applied to solve everyday problems. Um, and I think through that exercise, they were able to build capacity like Rachel mentioned. And I think I've seen that become really, really effective. Absolutely. Design thinking workshops. I love it. That sounds That's like awesome. That's so exciting to hear. I love it when like people are just like, let's learn new things and like UX can be one of them. Right. Um, and I think that's just like so huge. Um, and I think a lot of those skills too, just like we're in a world where like everything is converging in skill sets. Right. Um, it's just like becoming so much easier to learn stuff because of the accessibility of like information. And I think taking advantage of that, like no matter if you're in government or other industries is, is like wonderful. That's something that we did on our program. Uh, OPM has a lab that does a lot of training in the government on design thinking. And they came in and did a workshop for our entire program office. So that all of our product owners, um, all our technical folks, all of that had that background in design thinking. Everybody's everybody's a part of UX, right? It's kind of everybody's role. I think that's one of the themes that we wanted to talk about today. Yeah, every, everybody's job impacts the user experience. And so it's really important for people to understand that, that you impact the user experience and, and you should know how. Right, right, yep. absolutely. Exactly. That's, thank you so much, uh, Christy, I appreciate that. So we're gonna come to our last question that we have as a group. And then we're going to open it up to answer some of these really good audience questions. I think that the audience questions are um, very relevant to what we're seeing today. So I would love to get there. But first of all, the question is, I was looking for insider tips on how to better compete for agile dev contracts. What advice can you share? I mean, we've already talked about, you know, having a chief design officer, really investing at the leadership level, um, making UX something that everybody on the team is aware of. Um, and kind of what are some other things that could make the community more successful from a agile procurement successfulness side? I'm going to start with Mike. You yeah, and I talk uh, about this a lot. Yeah. Uh, well, one of the things is when you have successes at one agency that might be uh, trailblazing, like you have successes at USCIS, they're doing some cool things already. Uh, I know folks from industry can connect uh, folks that they've seen be successful with other potential clients in the government uh, to say, listen, hey, it's working over here. It's happening over here. This is how they're weaving in the design community to your normal uh, everyday developers that where you, you might not have figured that out yet. Here, why don't you talk to these people, especially in the, if, you, if you're trying to connect uh, procurement uh, folks, like specific the 1102 community, contracting officers, Contracting officers most of the time will do what other contracting officers have done before. Um, so if you can connect those those uh, folks have who have really given it a try and it's actually worked out before, that uh, that that will and they'll steal text from each other too uh, in terms of from RFPs. So if you have artifacts from RFPs that again you're seeing uh, lean the way that things should be going in your opinion. Uh, please share them. Share them also with uh, with a lot of the folks that are on the phone because we're trying to evangelize those things out there, whether it's through uh, websites. And I yield the rest of my time if there is any left. <laughs> so, Mike, quick question for you: Is there a, a, a liaison, if you will, person at USDS who can be who's like the go? Who's like the person you'd reach out to if you want to say, "Hey, we've had success at this agency. We wanted to connect the government customers." Um, is, is it a USDS thing or would you just go agency to agency or what's the best way do you think to be kind of sharing those successes with customers? Yeah, so, so there is a training program that was created, just a little bit of context, the digital IT acquisition program was created in concert with the Office of Federal Procurement Policy to start to train contracting officers on digital transformation type of 
technologies and how you buy them and some of the some of the issues associated with executing them. And so that community, as we've had three cohorts now, is now connected uh, by by our community of practice at the U.S. Digital Service, the acquisition, otherwise known as the Procurementati, uh, led by Tracy Walker at the U.S. Digital Service. So we, so I can throw out a question to the Procurementati or the overall DITAP, um, that's what they're called, DITAP um, community, and say, hey. I'm trying to do fixed price sprints over here for the first time. This organization's never done it before. What artifacts do you have and what POCs do you have? Let's connect. Um, there isn't a more formal way of doing that right now. And I think that's gonna be the next step in maturity for the community to, to really like start. Like reverse industry days or something like that. That is a thing, yes. The, the reverse industry day stuff is a thing where, uh, yeah, that's a thing. Awesome. Oh, the tech car hub. That's a good idea. Thank you, Dana. Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mike. I appreciate that. Okay, we're going to take this question. So I wanted to say that if you don't want to answer this particular question about um, insider tips on how to better compete for agile dev contracts, you can pick any of the questions in the audience here. Some of these audience questions are fantastic. This fail fast question, I think is super popular by everybody. So I'm happy to take that question instead. So I'm going to go ahead and, and come over to um, JC. You haven't gotten a lot of speaking time, JC. So you can answer that question or you can pick one over here and we'd love to give um, you the floor. Sure, sure. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I think for the insider tips piece, right? I, um, what I would say is um, think of it as telling a story, right? And what I mean by that is like from a UX perspective, there is two types of stories you can tell. One is more like a qualitative story right, which is more around like showing how, um, like if you're a contractor working for a different government agency, how did you go from like understanding about the user through to designing something, testing it with them, like the entire life cycle, right? Presented as though like this was the problem, this was what we had designed, this is how we tested it, we got the feedback, and then eventually rolled it out. And um, I think presenting that story as a whole would be a great way for like a program person who's evaluating the proposal to be able to understand, okay, where, where they're coming from. Um, another aspect I would say is more around the quantitative uh, storytelling, more around like, so the, uh, the biggest question that I always face um, within, within my current company, Appian, is, okay, so what's, what's ROI in UX? Like, how do you quantify if my UX is like benefiting anyone or if it's being useful, right? So think along the lines of like, okay, so what are some customer or uh, user conversion rates? Um, what are areas where your users are actually dropping off in your UI if you have a workflow, right? So come up with like those three to five metrics that you would, would be your go-to just to see like six months from, from now how successful I am. And putting those metrics into your proposal, I think that would be a great, great way to show UX success um, in, in your past performances, right? Um, and the third thing I would offer up to say is like, the US digital playbook, um, and that's that's a free website that you can go take a look at. And if you oh, see- You're gonna have, make Mike really happy talking about the playbook. <laughs> There's all these steps, very nice plays outlined. And if you see the first three, if you read into the first three steps of the digital playbook, it's all UX, right? Um, understanding the user, understanding their needs, uh, creating a, a flow based on that. So I think all, if these three factors, you can bring it all together into a, into a proposal and sell that to the government, I think that's, that's a great UX benefit. Awesome. Thank you so much, JC. Perfect. Um, Dana, let's come over to you. Sorry, I was distracted by finding the link for the playbook. Um, <laughs> no I, there were a couple of really great questions up here that I would like to uh, take a shot at. And um, one of them, where is it, where is it, where is it, where is it? Uh, uh, government's notorious for building walls between end users and development teams. What are some ways you found to be helpful in tearing those walls down? This is from uh, Matias Nino. So um, how this happened for me uh, at uh, US Citizenship and Immigration Services was totally opportunistic. Um, I was running a design studio, which I called a sketching session because nobody knows design vocabulary. Um, but I had front end developers and I had people from the business side and a couple, a couple of technical leads. And um, as I was trying to get people to sketch out prototypes of screens, um, the front end developers were asking 
all of these excruciating questions about um, edge cases and what ifs. And, and the business person finally said, we got to get you guys out into the field because it's clear that you don't know what the work is like. Um, and so like, if I could manufacture that situation again, I would totally do it. Um, cause it really worked. It, it um, spawned a program where we uh, sent out pods of developers and VAs to field offices. Um, I see this too in uh, election departments. My team uh, at the Center for Civic Design does a lot of work with state and county uh, election departments who run election, um, who do election administration. And um, while they talk to voters all the time, you know, putting messages out, they don't spend a lot of time actually paying attention to them. So um, we uh, bring the voters to them in, um, uh, in sessions like this, uh, in videos uh, or recordings uh, like this, and in stories from user research and usability testing. Awesome. I really love that. Um, the next person I call in can answer that question as well, or another one. Um, how to break down the walls between the end users and the Agile team, or you could answer the question, and what are some insider tips? So we'll come over to um, Christy. Okay, so um, gosh, I have answers to all of these. Um, the, the insider tip, I'm going to have a really quick insider tip, and then I'm going to talk about the fail fast question. Um, so uh, the the thing that stands out to me is um, is somebody who knows something about my users. So, you know, I've got 3 million users and they're very diverse and the problems that we ha have to solve, it's we're not a shopping website, we're not a public information website. We have a very specific type of user. So what stands out to me, it's more of a show me, not tell me. Show me that you know something about my users um, is what really stands out to me in terms of competing. Um, the fail fast question. So. About two years ago, we decided that we were going to take these 10 websites that we're bringing together and break them apart and put them back together in a very different way. Very risky, much riskier than taking and basically doing a lift and shift of 10 applications into, you know, the same platform. And if you look back at how we did that, we started off with really, really simple balsamic wireframe prototype. Um, it had almost no effort into it, and if I look at those screenshots now, they're embarrassing and cringeworthy to look at. But we had them in front of governance, we had a working group, we had them in front of industry, and we took that really simple prototype and said, here's the concept of what we're going to do. Um, it, it, tell us what you think. And, and iteratively have talked to people, have workshopped over and over again from simple prototype to implementation. Um, so it was, it was a think big idea because we, um, I mean, we took and created a single search across the data from all 10 websites and a single reporting center doing reports across the data from all 10 websites. It was a 90 degree pivot from the way that those systems had big, big move. Um, so big idea, um, little baby steps iteratively, you know, and if those first balsamic wireframes had failed, you know, it would have been a couple of weeks worth of work. We'd have thrown that idea away and gone back to the drawing board. Um, so very much prototyping and getting those prototypes as ugly as they were and as simple as they were in front of people fast. Awesome. I think his question was also hinging around if you're a contractor, right? And if you fail, fail fast, right? But do you have to fail faster and then come back from it? Because we can't, as contractors, I'm, I'm not willing to fail to then come back and you, you know what I'm saying? It's like, we're going to make it work. We're going to try our best, but if we fail, then we're letting the customer down and it's, it's, it's unacceptable. So I think his question was around how as contractors can we fail fast, but then come back fast to get better at what we're trying to do. Hopefully I've encapsulated his question correctly. I mean, as the, as the government, um, you know, the timelines aren't as regular rigorous because, we're, we're paid by the sprint right on these agile contracts. So how do we fail fast without failing in the entire program? So, so where we've seen that is, um, is, is where companies still want to do a big reveal for us and they don't want to show us their rough work. 
They're really concerned that if they put a half-baked idea in front of us, that we're not going to get it, that we're going to judge them harshly for a half-baked idea. Um, so it's, it's, it's really the relationship between you and the contractor. Um, I, would, I personally, and I know not everyone's the same, I personally would rather see something super rough really early on and often yeah. than have somebody go put an idea together and come back and do a big reveal. And it's almost always when I get a big reveal after a bunch of work has been invested that, um, that something goes horribly wrong. Um, where if I see something ugly and rough um, very early on, usually we can correct right away. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you so much, Christy. I appreciate hey, that. Alexa, can I add something to that real quick? Yep. Sure. Um, so I just wanted to quickly mention that um, uh, the other thing about design, the beauty of design is like, we're all visual people, right? We, we like to see things that are mocked up on paper. Um, not everyone likes to read through lines and lines of acceptance criteria and stories and so on. So um, I think regardless of our background, we might be contracts, program, uh, tech SMEs, UX SMEs, we're all going to relate to a wireframe or a mockup uh, much quicker than we would with uh, text, right? So I think that, is, could, that could be a really good conversation starter to have, make sure there's a base level of understanding across the board. So. Yep, JC, thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. I completely agree with you. And I think that goes back to what Rachel was saying about how the skills are converging into generalists rather than specialists. So, Alexa, can, that. Alexa, can I add to that? Sure. <clears throat> okay, so to, to bring this into more relatable how to implement this, um, one of the things that we've done uh, on a recent project that I worked on is we set up weekly sessions. Um, and in those sessions, you expect to, to, to present something and whether it's good or not, like Christy mentioned, the sooner you see it, the more you can, I mean, the quicker you can give feedback. So, right. so send, up, send up weekly sessions. It could be twice a week. It, it can be one, once a week. Um, once you sort of have a pretty good cadence and people understand and they come with an expectation that, hey, I'm going to see some wireframes here and there's a, a possibility that something might change by next time. I think that really helps in, 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 in that whole concept of failing fast. Right. Right. Absolutely. I agree with you on that one. Thank you, Mike. Okay. I'm going to come over to Rachel. Um, Rachel, I think we... You haven't got much talk time on this particular topic, whether it wanted, you wanted to pick this topic or if you wanted to pick one of the other ones, the audience has been very vocal. And thank you guys so much for that. Um, Beth, wherever you are, maybe we need to put you on a panel next time. <laughs> yeah, no, it's been great. It's good seeing you, Beth, on here. Um, I was gonna take a question that says, as an agile rookie, how might I best um, bring tools from service design and UX workshops, co-design, et cetera, into the sprint setting? Is that possible? What words, language do I, need to have as a grounding. Um, I think this is really interesting. I feel like I was just having this conversation with someone. Um, and for me, on a very tactical level, what I have personally done is like taken a lot of like high level blueprints or workflows and have brought them down into the epic level. So when you're doing your story writing for um, creating your backlog, what you have is essentially like a theme, which is like your epic. Right? And in that epic, what you can have is like, what are the stated user goals for that workflow? Um, you know, like, yeah, what are they trying to accomplish? Kind of like, and high level things from like the user research that came out um, that tied back to all those features. So that's kind of like one very small tactical way to um, bring in kind of that high level workflow mapping into kind of like backlog tools where developers are and where like product managers are and I really encourage if you have a PM working with them really closely to making sure that like all that is being translated. Um, and, and also like, again, if you're in a war room, having those things up, like simplified slogans, statements, really kind of like letting everyone breathe it. Um, those are kind of just like other ways to, to do it. But um, I think translating it into kind of like a backlog level is kind of like a really nice way to go because people understand then like how that ties to like the larger goals versus you know when developers are going through they're usually just focused on like one story at a time um, for doing feature development and what you're doing is you're bringing the team along with you to make sure that like they all understand like where it really ties back to that higher level need um, i love it communication at the higher level awesome yeah just really quick uh, contracts to we encourage people to talk about their goals. 
state use statement of objectives. Don't use statement of work. And so from a Thank contract you. perspective. Can you, can you put that out to the entire government? That would be awesome. Uh, okay, I'll get right on that. <laughs> so yeah, uh, but, but no, it enables so much more uh, in terms of creativity and in terms of new approaches. So if you're a novice trying to do these things and you want a partner to come in and, and even handhold with you, uh, that, that approach from a contract perspective opens things up significantly. And that's what that's what SUEs are designed for, and your contracting officer will understand that. And I and I think Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but we've made a lot of progress in in terms of agile procurement. And honestly, um, to plug AGL Live, we have an agile procurement upcoming AGL Live that I hope you guys will all register for. It's going to be awesome. And Brent, I think um, as usual, suspect in agile procurement works for USDS. I think he's going to be on the panel as well. And it's such an, it's an area that we've made tons and tons of progress on and I'm excited and due to people like you, Mike. So thank you for your efforts in that regard as well. Wow. No problem. Yeah, I know the <laughs> lights and you're crazy. <laughs> it just got all dark low. <laughs> just got cool. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna, um, guys, we've got five minutes left really. And what I would love to do is give all of our panelists one last chance to just like one last takeaway. Um, this does get shut down and Four minutes, I gotta hurry. Okay, so let's come over to Dana, you start, and we'll just run down the panel and we'll, everybody will give like one last comment. Oh God, I don't know. Um, just, um, when you focus on user needs, you have a vision. Awesome, perfect, I love it. Okay, uh, JC. Um, it's all about empathy, is my takeaway for users. Yeah, and I think that's an interesting one because not everybody knows what empathy is. In fact, I didn't until I did a lot of looking up what it was. There's a couple of great videos out there that explain what it is. Absolutely. Thank you, JC and Christy. Uh, so uh, for me, I think it comes down to, to knowing your users, knowing your customer and the context that you're in and, um, and being able to adapt to, to knowing your users. Perfect, I appreciate that. Michael Akindo? All right, uh, I think I'm gonna try to make it more about finding great talent. Uh, UX people, great UX people show great leadership, leadership skills and leadership qualities. So look for people that demonstrate leadership um, um, qualities um, because they will be the advocate for your users across the board. Absolutely, thank you so much for that. Um, Rachel, I'm gonna come to you and then Mike Palmer, you'll be the last one, so Rachel. Yeah, I think it's just echoing everything people have said here. Um, obviously, being with your users is key, but um, don't forget building relationships internally with like all your stakeholders because um, like all their all their opinions and what their thoughts are is important as well. Yep, absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. And Mike Palmer, last one, wrapping it up. Last one. You're not the only ones trying to do this. There are other people trying to do these amazing things. So connect with them and have them share their war stories, lessons learned, artifacts, and do amazing things where you are. Perfect. Thank you so much to the panel. I want to give you guys a big round of applause. Thank you, everybody, so much. Thank you. The audience questions have been awesome. We're going to um, actually send out as a thank you for attending all the big bullet points so nobody can miss with anything that we've talked about. Really do appreciate that. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. And this whole thing will be shut down in a couple minutes. So. If anybody has any last minutes, we've got two minutes. Last comments. Yeah, keep the questions coming on Twitter. We will try to get them distributed to our panel. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Join us next month. Take care. Thanks, guys. Bye, everyone. Thank you.